Hello, BookTube. It's me again. <laughs> I, <coughs> I promise I'm not going to keep bombarding you with videos today. It's just that it's the 4th of July. It's Independence Day here in America. And that uh, means no mail, no shops open, no one around. Uh, and that's left me with a tiny bit of the illusion of a tiny bit of time on my hands. Uh, <clears throat> and I spent the day, as I usually do, I, I made a few early morning calls to a couple of places I visit uh, on every 4th of July. And then I came back, did a ton of reading, did, did some writing, made some phone calls. Uh, it's a much cooler 4th of July than usual here in Boston, so that's been nice. I haven't had to worry about dogs. Uh, and now, as the you know the sun is is starting to set all across, it, it'll, it'll the sunsets are starting to happen all across the country, and that means that uh, the parades that are happening all day will be winding down, the massive suppers and cookouts and beach parties will be uh, starting up in earnest, and and also the fireworks will be happening all across the country, uh, and including here in Boston, the cradle of American liberty where we have a dew on the Charles River that uh, you really have to see once in your life, you really should. But it'll, it's live streamed on YouTube for free, so if you can't get here, it's the next best thing. Uh, and it's got me thinking, uh, the, the day has got me thinking in terms of America, in terms of this, this country that I, I love with a passion. A few people always, every year I will always get questions from some people saying, do you even care about the 4th of July? Is it, a, is it a holiday that you celebrate? And it very much is. There are only two. Uh, 4th of July and New Year's are the only holidays that I care about. The one for personal reasons and the one for patriotic reasons, as corny as that sounds. Uh, and since I've been thinking these thoughts anyway, and since I love making regular features on this channel <laughs> that have to do with books, I thought I'd make a new one starting on this 4th of July, but I promise I won't just update it on 4th of July. I will update it regularly until we're done. Uh, something that I want to call Presidential Library, where we will go through books about the American presidents from the beginning all the way to Barack Obama. Uh, and we'll stop there. As, as uh, I, We don't need to argue about it. I certainly don't want to get histrionic about it, but uh, in ways that are not immediately obvious to uh, what I, from what I can tell, almost any professional commentator, in a lot of ways, the American presidency and also the American form of government stopped at the end of Barack Obama's term. Uh, it, we can reconvene in 25 years, and I will point out what I mean. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime. That makes a perfect terminus. That makes a perfect stopping point. Uh, and that gives us a lot of ground to cover. Of, of course, starting with the very first president of the United States, George Washington, uh, who is the uh, foremost mythological president, as well as being the first president, was, was chosen for mythological reasons, largely created himself as an, as an object of mythology. And even in his better moments, which were very few, acted mythological, tr tried to act up to his own, his own mythos. Uh, so because of that, because from the very beginning mythology was interwoven with everything he did and said and everything that everybody thought about him, uh, he's a really tricky person to read about. And there has, it doesn't help any that there have been whole buildings, whole stadiums full of books written about him <laughs> from the very beginning while he was still alive. And, and after he died, the floodgates opened. Uh, most of those books, probably 99% of them, a, a much, much higher percentage than you would get with almost any other historical figure. The only other one I can think of would be Jesus. Uh, it, probably 99% of those books are utterly worthless. Literally, should not that you should not take the, exercise the many jewels of effort necessary even to open the covers. They are literally worthless. In fact, they're worse than worthless. They're harmful. They promulgate harmful mythologies where only the facts should stand. Uh, <laughs> which means that once you know that, and once you know what you're looking at, you can eliminate a lot of your choices <laughs> for Washington biographies. And I'm going to show you some. We'll talk about just a few 
here. I won't make this a very long video. It'll be just our first one, the Presidential Library. From Washington, we will move on. Uh, but uh, with Washington, once you realize that almost everybody who writes about him is writing about the mythology rather than the person for their own reasons, and that this is not an antique habit, it's not just Parson Weems that's happy to tell mythology about George Washington. It extends to the present day. Ron Chernow, one of our most honored biographers, just comparatively recently wrote a thousand page biography of Washington that was almost entirely worshipful mythology in a very harmful way. What, what good does it do to paper over the humanity of, of the founding president of the United States of America? Uh, unfortunately, uh, that applies even to books about Washington that I like, in, including the first book we're going to talk about, which is one that I love. <laughs> and it's, this is just one cover, it could be anything. It's, it's uh, the long biography of Washington that was done by Washington Irving, who was named after the president. And, and the book of Irving's made Washington not only the first president of the United States, but the first president to have a great writer write a book about him, which you might think happens all the time, but that's not true. It doesn't. It doesn't happen all the time, as we will see. Most presidents have not had a great book written about them. Uh, and, of course, even fewer have written a great book themselves. We'll get to those as well. But most, book, most presidents, despite the fact that they command the attention, the loyalty, the purse of an entire country, most of them have not managed to have a great book written about them. Uh, good books, yes, but not a great book. And I ought to have a great writer write about them. Unfortunately, in this particular case, the case of Washington, the two aren't the same. <laughs> I would love it. I would absolutely love it if Washington Irving had written a great book about Washington. He wrote a great Washington Irving book, but it's all mythology. I, it's one of the only instances of a of, of, of Washington book of mythology that uh, I would still urge you to read, just because, for, for two reasons. One... Uh, because I think everybody should read more of Washington Irving than they do, especially Americans. He's he's totally forgotten when he made your literature. Uh, but also, too, because uh, Irving did a lot of research for the book. It wasn't particularly good research. He was more uh, Livy than Tacitus. Uh, but he set a lot of the groundwork. It isn't just Parson Weems. It isn't just anonymous pamphlet of tears talking about bodily assumptions into heaven. It's Washington Irving who set a lot of the, the framework involved for good and bad Washington biographies. So his book is, I mean, it's free on Project Gutenberg, so it wouldn't cost you anything. And uh, you might like it. It, if it. If it brings you into the sway of Irving's prose style to the point where you want to read more of him, it will have done its job. <laughs> uh, but for, for vast decades after Irving, there's nothing that's that's worthwhile to read at all, and that's uh, that's kind of depressing. <laughs> uh, so the the rest of the books I want to show you, I mean, there are some smart people. Richard Brookheiser is a very smart guy. Came time to write a Washington biography, it was the same thing with Ron Chernow. I I cannot see past what I want this man to be, as opposed to what he really was. I want him to be above the fray. I want him to be marble. I want him to be pure, and brilliant, and fearless and moral, and upstanding, and Washington wasn't any of those things. He was an idiot. He was a, a, a vile, violent man. He was a horrible, minatory slave owner of a type of such pettiness and violence that even his fellow slave owners thought he was taking things a bit far. <laughs> he was he grasped the, for the whole of his life. He grasped for money and power and fame He's an overweening egotist and a liar of the first water. And his lies took because he knew how to tell them. So today, in 2017, you will find modern biographies of Washington that piously repeat the fact that when he served as commander-in-chief during the American Revolution, he, he high-mindedly refused to take a salary from Congress. And they won't repeat the other half of that, which is that, yes, he refused to take a salary from Congress, but his invoices for every single thing under the sun, added together or quintuple what his salary would have been. He expected all of those to be paid. People will talk about, you know, how they will talk about 
how conscientious he was and how broad-minded and how he, he didn't really like the institution of slavery, he just had to go along with it. And then you read the specifics of the records and you see a man enjoying cruelty. <laughs> you, you will read stories about his bravery under fire. Okay, I'll give him that. You'll also read stories about his tactical genius when the man was a tactical disasterist who started a world war when he was barely out of his 20s <laughs> and, and barely did anything right when he was given command of an army in the field. I, <laughs> unfortunately, you encounter that all the time in Washington biographies. You encounter scholarly, smart biographers who know all of that and simply refuse to grapple with it. They, they would rather talk about the myth. Uh, so one of the... Uh, strands that you'll notice, one of the recurring themes if you if you survey Washington literature, is that often what, some of the best books are written as sort of studies of the man rather than biographies of him. You still get a lot of the biography in them, but they, they have a more theoretical approach. And I have found that a lot of times that will save a writer from hagiography, from pure hero worship. And I want to show you two of those books that are quite good, very good. They're not specifically biographies, but you know what I mean. They're, they're close enough. They're biographical studies of Washington that are well worth your time. On the small shelf of worthwhile Washington books, they both merit a place. The first one is Gary Wills, Cincinnatus. The subtitle is George Washington and the Enlightenment, and the title, of course, refers to the Roman myth of the, the general who really all he wanted was a peaceful life on his farm, working with his slaves and tending his crops and having a peaceful life but the, the state kept needing him and calling him back from his plow and that was a myth that applied to Washington early on started a whole bunch of societies Cincinnati societies uh, and Wills examines that in light of of the, the the enlightenment that was broiling all around the country at the time and I he does a wonderful job yeah, I'm not always his biggest fan but this is a wonderful book on point the whole time uh, and the next one is is the same thing it's it's only much better it's Richard Norton Smith patriarch and the subtitle is George Washington and the new American nation and it's it's about not just the founding mythology but the founding mechanisms and the role that Washington played in them and it is Richard Norton Smith never wrote a bad book and this is just incredible it's a, it's a thing to find it's a book to find it's a Washington book you will really really love and then of course when you get to Washington in used bookstores, most of your used bookstores, in most libraries, and most yard sales or anything like that, there's one author that you're going to encounter connected with him more than anybody else, uh, and that's uh, James Thomas Flexner, who wrote a book called The Indispensable Man, Washington, The Indispensable Man. That subtitle will give you an idea of the fact that, an accurate idea, that, that Flexner is, he's, He's got two toes in hagiography territory. He very much worships Washington, but he does a thorough job. He's a very rigorous historian. Uh, and uh, The Indispensable Man is still the best one volume biography of Washington that you can get, even though you have to take it with a grain of salt. And uh, it's a condensation. It's, it's, a, it's a one volume abridgment of a multi-volume work that Flexner did that <laughs> I don't want to be put unrealistic demands on your TBRs, but the, the multi-volume work is actually much better than the abridgment. It's, the multi-volume work follows Washington through different periods in his career, the military, the government, retirement, statescraft, uh, and there, each volume is much fuller. Each one is as long as the, independent, as the indispensable man is, uh, so they form like a shelf on their own when you're done with them, uh, and they're much better. The, they are so buried in facts and dates and solving controversies and raising interesting questions and finding out what actually happened when and who was in the room. Uh, they're so involved with the minutia of that that they almost don't have time to hero worship, uh, which is great. Uh, so uh, I, I actually highly recommend the multi-volumes if you can find them. But you can certainly find The Indispensable Man, and it still is. In this series, we will pick one book per president. That if you have to read only one book, it's the one you should read. And for all of those reasons, I'm afraid it's still going to be, for me, uh, Washington, The Indispensable Man, even though it's 50 years old. Uh, because it's, it's, even with its tendency to starry eyes, it's still the most balanced. 
Uh, so that that is Washington. That is the very first uh, book in our presidential library. <laughs> and uh, from Washington, we'll move on to uh, far more familiar territory for me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll see you then. Thank you, BookTube.